kitchen industries, the value of patents and trade secrets, and so on. On to the third panel. The ground rules are the same. Um, I have a very distinguished group of speakers and discussants, and I will not go through their bios. They're all here, so please read them. They're all marvelously credentialed and distinguished. And uh, we have Professor Mark Schultz. Professor from Southern Illinois University and one of the co-organizers of this conference. Going first. So Mark, 13 minutes. Thank you. So I have a PowerPoint, but meanwhile, I'll be talking about trade secrets. And the motivation for talking about trade secrets in the context of the innovation industries is that uh, I, I think they're an underappreciated and somewhat misunderstood right uh, that is becoming uh, that's coming into increasing prominence as countries around the world recognize the importance as part of their innovation system uh, that because they're important as a complementary form of IP to uh, to innovation complementary to patents and trademarks and uh, they're increasingly under threat uh, from from theft and uh, from the erosion of rights because they become more portable whenever you can you know, an employee can walk out with a thumb drive full of, of vast amounts of information, whereas, you know, they would have had to, you know, load up a truck with paper 25 years ago. So my talk has three parts. Uh, I'll explain how trade secrets are intellectual property and what that means. Uh, I'll discuss the value of trade secrets, why they're, why they're valuable, and I'll briefly address uh, India's trade secret regime. Okay, so trade secrets is intellectual property. Now, first, let's understand what trade secrets are, because I said they're underappreciated. Um, you know, when, when you say trade secret, the name tells you a lot. Trade, uh, it's commercially valuable information, and secret, uh, it's information that's not readily ascertainable, uh, and is indeed subject to reasonable efforts to keep it secret. Um, and it, it needs to derive value, commercial value, from being kept secret. Now, the, it, one of the interesting things about trade secret uh, law is it protects the, this confidential information, this, this valuable proprietary information, but it only protects it from wrongful um, appropriation, you know, wrongful acts, misappropriation. It can be appropriated in other ways. It can be reproduced in other ways. So the law protects against um, against theft, against crime, uh, trespassing, torts, threats, economic espionage, but it doesn't protect against uh, independent discovery. It doesn't uh, protect against reverse engineering, which leads many to say that trade secrets couldn't possibly be a property right or an intellectual property right. And in fact, that was one of the points that the European Union uh, study that led up to the European Union's recent trade secret directive, there was a point made in that by some scholars in, in the vast amount of reports and studies the EU did. They said, well, trade secrets aren't really a property right because you can't absolutely exclude people from the topic, the, the subject matter. Now, it's actually the case that trade secrets can be property. Um, and they're a particular type of property. They're a right to use, an exclusive right to use. And, and that matters because um, you, that you have a right to use them without interference. The creator has a right to use what they created um, and to enjoy and reap the benefits of their labor without interference from others. But they can't prevent other people from, from reproducing the same labor independently. So the analogous right here might be uh, certain forms of water rights, where you don't, where the the person you know who is a pertinent to a stream, for example, doesn't own the water per se, but they have a right to use it without interference, uh, and that's what trade secrets are, and that is a property right. It's it's a different kind of property right, but it's important that owners have a certain amount of security in that right 
the, the exclusive right to use what they've created, uh, even though they can't stop others from creating it independently. And in fact, uh, another important point about trade secrets that I want to share is that they're different from secrets. They're often criticized uh, and held up as, I guess, maybe a foil to patents. And so people say, well, trade secrets, they're less, um, they lead to less collaboration, less disclosure than patents. So they're less efficient, and there's truth to that. But let's also remember that they're different from secrets because you always will have secrets in business. What trade secrets are is legally recognized protection. And ironically, the existence of a, an effective trade secret law allows the owner to be more forthcoming, to collaborate more, to disclose more without fear because they have legal recourse. If you don't have legal protection, then all you have is a secret, and once the secret is breached, it's gone because you have no legal recourse. So trade secrets actually encourage uh, a certain amount of cooperation and disclosure. They make it safer to share. Making it safer to share is why trade secrets are valuable. Being Making an innovator more secure in that proprietary information they've created is good for business, it's good for consumers, it's good for innovation. Why is it good for business? Uh, because businesses, because trade secrets are far and away the form of intellectual property most relied upon by businesses, most often, around the world. Uh, when the European Union was studying uh, the trade secrecy in, in preparation for its trade secret directive, it found, it surveyed businesses, it found that of all their strategies, for gaining a competitive advantage. Um, trade secrets were the leading form of intellectual property. Now, of course, two business methods. Uh, the, the first two columns, oh, this is a little too blurry to see. The first two columns represent lead time. They represent competitive advantage, business strategies. But the third column is reliance on trade secrets, which far outstrips reliance on trademarks, patents, and copyrights. Uh, businesses rely on trade secrets. And why do they rely on trade secrets? Uh, because they make a difference. They make a difference to who you can hire and how your business grows. Why? Because we found in countries where trade secrets aren't protected well, fam businesses often remain small and family businesses. Why? Because you trust family. You don't hire outsiders. You don't bring lots of people in. Um, when you have trade secret protection, a business is more likely to hire strangers and work with strangers. They're more likely to collaborate with other businesses if they can do so under a non-disclosure agreement with some expectation it'll be protected. Um, they are more willing to invest in developing certain protect products and features uh, because this innovation might be protected. Uh, and they have to spend, ironically, spend less on protecting secrets, right? Because the law allows it gives you recourse, you can spend an efficient amount on protecting secrets rather than absolutely having to protect them under lock and key the same way. Um, trade secrets can be good for consumers because businesses make business decisions about where to sell their products and where to locate. Um, it, where to locate their facilities based in part on this kind of protection. Um, we studied this, uh, a co-author and I studied this for the OECD. Uh, we created a trade secret protection index that rated the strength of trade secrets for 40 countries objectively uh, across the past 30, de 30 years. Uh, and what we found, and then we, we, looked, at, we looked at some correlations, uh, and we found some positive relationships between a number of things. And one of those things was imports of particular products. Uh, we saw uh, a positive relationship with respect to real FDI inflows, uh, with respect to high-tech services, and even with respect to merchandise. And when I talked to some consumer products companies, they said this makes sense because we do have a lot of trade secrets involved in our distribution methods, etc. And so we do, we do, it may influence our decisions to some extent. So even what products are available, but also, um, trade secrets are good for innovation. They have an effect, we, we found a positive relationship with some important indicators for R&D. 
For example, we found a positive relationship between trade secret protection and resident patent applications. And that was a little bit counterintuitive to some people because they think there's a trade-off between patents and trade secrets. And there is at the level of a particular technology. But what you have to think of is that trade secrets protect the entire R&D effort. And only a few highlights of that effort, the things that don't fail, the things that are particularly novel and meet the other requirements of patentability, you can patent those. But on the way to obtaining things that are patentable, you have to do a lot of R&D. You don't want your employees walking out the door with it. So, so trade secrets make R&D more secure, which are, interestingly leads, leads, at least, you know, makes this positive relationship with patenting plausible. We also saw the same with respect to real R&D expenditures. Uh, and we were holding, th this was, we, we were also uh, controlling for patent strength. Sure. Okay. So the last thing I want to address briefly is how India's trade secret regime compares with its peers. Uh, so in our study, the OECD study, uh, we found that India's trade secret laws were, um, were perhaps, uh, in, they were in the lower third of trade secret laws in the world uh, of the sample we studied. And part of that is because its common law system has not uh, really been updated from in many ways from the British, uh, from the English law that, that India inherited. And thus, there are certain aspects of trade secret law that haven't been modernized. For example, uh, third, third party misappropriation isn't clearly protected against uh, the, the kind of economic espionage that countries are increasingly worried about. Uh, and what we were looking at when we thought about these problems in our study, when we thought about why businesses care about trade secrets, we asked several questions. Um, from the point of view of a business, they want to know, is the de are trade secrets defined in a way that they expect in the rest of the world? This third party, this third party misappropriation problem was one, that, one place where India stood out as, as not having caught up with many other common law countries. Uh, they want to know whether they can get injunctions quickly to protect their secrets from being destroyed or leaked. And that was a common critique, critique from within India of the, the ability to protect trade secrets that injunctions were challenging to obtain. Um, another thing that India doesn't have is a criminal, criminal law. We've, we've addressed that many times. It'll probably come up in the Q&A. So I won't address that at length except to note that in cases of government-sponsored economic espionage, uh, that is increasingly, you know, the, the topic of controversy and discussion, um, that's the sort of thing you often need government help with. And so those were the things we, we found that, you know, India could do to make its, uh, make its laws strategically more competitive with other countries. And in discussing this with the Indian government, um, we, we were, we, the Indian government and the U.S. government held a joint trade secret workshop in late 2016, and we attended that workshop. And the interesting thing for all participants were that the voices of the SMEs stood out. And the small and medium enterprises in that room, the Indian small and medium enterprises said, we need a trade secret law that we can understand, that's clear to us, and that we can rely on because trade secrets are important to us. And I think everybody in that room took note of that and I think that is an interesting point. And with that, I leave you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Prabhuda Ganguly, the CEO of Vision IP and visiting professor at Raj the Rajiv Gandhi School of IP in IIT Kharagpur. Uh, what I thought I would do is uh, take you through a, a different regime uh, in patents and specifically going into a completely different field of uh, artificial intelligence and what uh, the whole area of artificial intelligence holds out, uh, you know, and what are the sort of challenges in law that we have. Because since we're going back to basics, I thought this is an area which really takes us back to basics. So the first part, I don't want to go into details of it, but we are all familiar that artificial intelligence has sort of, you know, come into our lives in more than one way. And, uh, most important are that in the third point, smart social systems, independent and lifelike emotive 
rapid learners and autonomous creators and performers. But artificial intelligence systems are really autonomous now. Okay, we have really come to that particular way. And I created a new term uh, that we are actually moving from humanoids to what I call as AI sapiens. Okay, rather than Homo sapiens, probably not the other part, which is very important, is that now you are having embedded biological systems, which are sort of augmented biological systems, or even augmented humans. And one of the questions that will come about is that if I get augmented through an AI system, am I still a natural person? In which case, if I do something creative, can I file a patent? Because am I you know, any more a natural person? Very important question out there. And therefore, we are coming into a system of what I call as a new hybrid sociology. And the new hybrid sociology is what I will bring in later will be natural persons, augmented persons, completely artificial intelligent systems, ro robots, and a whole range of you know, mutated nervous systems. And when we come to that, there are various issues that come before us, uh, like personal responsibilities, liabilities, creativity, intellectual property rights, etc., etc. And I just wanted to show you that these are the 10 most, what they call, as most emotional robots that actually exist today. Okay. Uh, some of them, many of you have seen. And the interesting part is that here is a painting. Actually, a real thing which has happened is called the New Rembrandt. And two AI systems were actually uh, taken to the museum. They studied all the Rembrandt paintings and they created the New Rembrandt. But the question is, who is now the author or who is the painter? Who is the creator? Question. Okay. Now, the important part is that there are legal issues. One, of course, is AI and theory of personal. Why this is important? Because the moment it comes to that, all issues of inventorships and other things are all in that area, AI and liability, and of course, with infringement and other issues that will come in there, AI and law of creativity. Now, as we go through that, what are the challenges? One is, of course, what will be the governance framework? The legal governance framework, that's the first part. And if you come to autonomous AI system, the role in the innovation value chain and the business value chain in the marketplace. It will be extremely important. The ownerships are going to be important. Transfer of rights are going to be important. Gaining of rights are going to be important, all that. And therefore, the next part is what are the responsibilities and liabilities? That if an AI system infringes, then who is infringing? Am I the creator of the AI system infringing or the AI system? Because the AI system now is independent of me. It's like if my daughter infringes, am I liable or my daughter is liable? Very simple. Okay? And AI, you know, development of appropriate policies are very important out there. So now when you look at these issues here, should AI systems be granted personal, should they be considered as legal entities? Very important. And when you come to that, you have to come to the personality theory. And the jurisprudence then, you have to go into the, a completely different jurisprudence. And what are the type of debates today? The type of debates today is, as I told you, one school of thought should depend on deep normative structure, which means that shared values, value judgments, and conceptions that shape the social fabric of particular society. So is it going to be utilitarian? And is that going to decide whether they should get personal? Modern AI systems are you know, anthropomorphic. So human like looks, smartness, what I showed you in those pictures out there, should we consider them? On civilized as corporate persons. So now we have to relook at the jurisprudence. It's a complete revisiting of the jurisprudence out there. Second point. Third point. Should AI systems be given the strength of minors? I told you that should that be as humans as taking that. So that, you know, you're talking about a jurisprudence of minor and parenthood. Then this is a very important part. For example, in India, the Hindu idols in the temples, right? If you take that, they have, they have been granted personal. So all these things have, so should AI systems, based on those sort of things, be given a personal? Are AI systems <coughs> capable of understanding rights and obligations? And therefore, can you go through that particular bit? And of course, the important part that comes about is that are they smarter than humans, and therefore ethical and other issues come into the picture. So when you come to that, the existing laws and future paradigms to understand you need to understand the roles and uh, responsibilities. 
of these electronic personalities if they are given electronic personalities? This is a very important part. That is, AI systems, when you, when you develop an AI system, you have to train it. Like we get trained, we, we, we experience, we correct ourselves, we then use that experience, and AI systems are exactly done that way. It uses a huge amount of data. The question is that, there, that as far as data is concerned, that are we talking about privacy issues? What sort of data are we going to use? Can we use public data? Can we use private data? Are we sort of creating biases by selecting the type of data? So there are lots of issues that are going to come about in the training of such systems, and therefore the utilization of AI systems in its applications are going to play a very important role. So that's that part. Now, the important part is therefore looking at these on a totality. You find the European Parliament on 16 February 2000, uh, sorry, whatever. Yeah, on February 16, uh, 2017, they actually, you know, produced a paper, which is now being considered, and you know, it's going to be taken up shortly in Europe to really look at all these particular details of uh, various aspects. The other very important part, which I want to take a couple of minutes here, is the creativity, AI, and IPR. And that is the first question: is that since these are autonomous systems, they can create. They can invent. They can create works which may be copyrightable. So the questions that are going to be asked, if they are not given personhood, then what happens to all these works? What happens to these inventions? So first and true inventor, what is going to happen to that particular bit? Authors of works capable of being produced by copyright, can AI system own intellectual property? Can it transact intellectual property? Can you get into contracts? Because you're going to use AI systems in a whole range of creative activities. So they'll get into contracts. So the contract is with whom? The AI system or the person who created the AI system? Now if you do it with the person who created the AI system, who is the author? Because So there are a lot of issues of this type that are coming up. And therefore, what is happening is that when you look at the marketplace today, where AI systems are being used increasingly in business processes and business practices, especially in Industry 4. Leave aside the mechanical and robotics part of it, but go into things which are self-learning and autonomous systems. This creates big problems in jurisprudence. Um, uh, so, hey, why is it stuck? Why is it stuck? Seems to have stuck. See, you need an AI system for this. Can you go to the next slide? Just quickly. So I don't overshoot my time. Yeah, is it okay? Wonderful. Really? No? Not all of you. See, there are the problems with technology. Small. Somewhere it has got stuck. Doesn't matter. Just let's proceed even without the slides. Now, therefore, when you look at these systems, therefore, one of the issues that comes about in these will be, yeah, will be, in terms of infringement, liabilities, and most important in all these aspects that we are talking about, is that when these AI systems become a part of a collaborative process with humans, uh, are you there? Are you there? Or you have to, don't worry about it. So when you get into this particular collaborative part with humans, right, are you going to have joint authorships, joint ownerships? So what is going to happen is, as you look into the jurisprudence of uh, you know, things, including the AI systems, there's going to be a big challenge ahead out there. And therefore, what is going to happen is, the very definition. Now imagine what's, what's happening today. You're, because these are self-learning systems, you are able to even augment human brain with that. You can augment human abilities with those. Now once 
you do that sort of things. For example, if you're going to have a conference of this type, say 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line, what will you have? What will be the type of people sitting in this audience, including lecturing? A, persons like me, who are still natural. You'll have augmented persons with AI. You'll have AI systems sitting there, right, of the types which I showed you there. You will have, for example, if you augment me, with time, it will enhance some of my abilities, it will suppress some of my abilities, which means I'm going to mutate. So my offsprings, my mutated offsprings, will be natural persons out there. So you'll have those sort of things. So the society is going to be very complex. And that's not very far, just 15, 20 years down the line. So we need to rethink the entire aspect of law, patent law, copyright law, and many of these particular aspects. The last part which I want to do is that because there are a lot of experiments which are happening with human brain and AI systems, now the concepts of patentability will change. Why? Two things. What we call as obvious, what we call as uh, Okay, leave it there. So what we call as obvious today, or non-obvious, may be obvious to the AI enhanced system. Number two, the way we will access information, the way I'll be able to go into your brain probably and hack into your brain, and the way you may be able to hack into my brain, trade secrets are going to be in another big jeopardy. So all these questions are going to be uh, in front of us, and therefore I think as lawyers we now need to sit back, really go back to the basics and think about the way we will handle such systems. And therefore I thought, very interesting, that when they go to AI systems, you know all the questions, constitutional questions will also come in. Right to information will come in. You know, right to read, right to education, all the things will have to be revisited. And therefore I thought, let me put, you know, the last, can you go to the last one? Just go forward. Just go further, go further, go further. No, go back, that's it. And therefore I thought that, you know, the definition is going to be a big problem. What is human? So I just came to my definition of human. To earn is human. To continue to learn is divine. And then I thought, this is what we are talking about. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Professor Dunn. Uh, we have, a, due to a scheduling conflict, our next speaker will be Dr. S.K. Murthy, who is one of our discussants, who is uh, the Patent Counsel from Intel India. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Mr. Nataraj. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, thanks to National Law University, Delhi. I'm happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> before I uh, start off, I just want to give you some context about why trade secrets are important. Of course, Professor Mark has uh, spoken uh, volumes about the importance of trade secrets. Uh, just to give you a pointer, uh, around 11th century, India was India as a country was the biggest contributor to world GDP at 32 percent or so, and no other country had contributed has contributed to the world GDP at that level. Right? And China was a distant second, uh, around 22 or 23 percent. Why I am saying this is uh, where trade secrets really valued them. And if you look at some of the uh, comment, commentary from historians, it clearly indicates that there was major emphasis for protection of trade secrets. Right? So uh, with that, I don't have to emphasize more about the need for protection of trade secrets. Right? There is definitely a need for protection for trade secrets. And the importance is already covered. What I want to bring to this uh, dais is one of the common questions that we get to uh, get to be asked is what is missing in the present system, right? There is con a very good contract law, well-developed contract law. There is a good civil law in this country. There is a good criminal law in this country. What are we missing? Why do we need a separate trade secret law, right? And some of the pointers were in the files in the presentation, definition of a trade secret. And if a third party steals it, or if a third party takes it, what is the remedy that we have? Are there criminal prosecutions that are available, right? 
from that perspective, uh, we should definitely come up with a very good articulation of what is available today, what is present today in the system, and where is the gap, and is this gap sufficient enough to uh, give us a reason to ask for a new trade secret law? Probably that would, uh, that would be very articulate when we go and talk to the government and convince them about the need for a trade secret law here. In 2016 or so, we had this conversation with the government, but uh, after that, nothing seemed to have happened. So probably uh, from my thinking, what would be more effective would be, okay, here is a system which is not adequate to address the concerns of trade secret law. So probably identifying this gap and articulating well would be uh, a good starting point to restart the conversation. On the AI systems, I have several things to say. Um, when we talk about AI systems, Professor Prabhuda Ganguly was talking about uh, algorithms and uh, deep learning al algorithms, neural network training, uh, machine learning, all these things are um, very tightly worn with AI systems. If you look at this, are these all protectable under the present patent regime? If it is not protectable, then what should, what should it be? What should our new patent system be? Uh, unfortunately, um, we talk about when it comes to uh, computer programs and patentability of software, we still have conversations around uh, whether a novel hardware requirement is a must, right? Mm, probably it is time for us to get off from that position and talk about the impact of all these algorithms and the effect that it would have on the total ecosystem. And all these things should be patentable or not is a big question. And if we have to, uh, if we say that all these things have, has to be patentable, where do we create the balanced, e balanced patentable system? Balanced patent system is a big question. So these are some of the things that we need to talk about. And it's a great time to be a lawyer. Why I say this is, um, all these years, technology was far ahead of the legal, right, or the law. Technology would go uh, to a particular extent and law would always be catching up. But today, from my personal experience, this is what I see. Technologists and lawyers are sitting together to decide what should be done next. It's a great place to begin and we have a real play where we can decide what the policy should be. And this is a great opportunity for the legal fraternity to work with the technologists and create a future which is safe. Uh, probably these are some of the comments that I had now. As of now. Thank you, Dr. Murthy. Um, our third speaker is uh, Mr. Nakraj, founder, law chambers of G. Nakraj. Thank you, Dr. Kaysen. Thank you, Dr. Gandhi, Dr. Dr. Schultz, and uh, Mr. Murthy. Uh, thank you to Yogesh and Darul and uh, the others at NLU for having me over. Uh, first note of caution, please don't go too much by the uh, brief bio that's put out in the brochure. It's not absolutely accurate. So leave that. Uh, in these 13 minutes, uh, I'm actually in a bit of a quandary right now. I had originally planned on just explaining the experience of one of our clients in the HVAC segment, which is heating, ventilation, air conditioning uh, sector. And uh, it's, it's an Indian company and their transition from the classic, I am also an industry player who also manufactures equipment for, heat, for the heating, ventilation, air conditioning industry into a company which actually today is probably uh, number one in India, at least within the top five in the world in this particular segment, which has in the past 14 years uh, tied in its development of its intellectual property portfolio with the patents or trade secrets or any other design rights, etc., 
along with strategic acquisitions across the world. And when I say across the world, I do not mean just in, let's say, the lesser developed nations, but also in the developed West. It's been an interesting experience being with them. That was part of, that was what I was planning on doing and I will do that. But before that, uh, I looked at the actual title for this panel and uh, it, it actually for a change made me think. There's one thing that's very interesting and that's a syntax in the title. It says the value of patents and trade secrets. Typically for a practitioner, and I'm a practicing lawyer, you tend to look at them as alternatives. You look at either patents or trade secrets. What I find very intriguing here and actually quite healthy in its own way is the fact that you're looking at patents and trade secrets. The second question which disturbs me slightly and it's probably a topic for a separate workshop is what do you mean by an innovation industry? Because I'm not very clear as to exactly what an innovation industry is. Every industry has innovation in it. The levels of innovation may be small, they may be large, they may be important in the scheme of the commercial interests of that particular industry or they may be humongously large in the scheme of the commercial interests of that particular industry but there is innovation. There is innovation at the plant level with a workman who perhaps has an education which is probably not even high school work person I should say. There could be innovation in an R&D laboratory. So I do have a bit of a problem here with the term innovation industry. I'll quickly uh, give the example of this client of ours. Its name is, is called the Pava Group and the transition has been very interesting. Till about 1997, 1998, they were a company which was good in manufacturing. They had a good set of manufacturing skills. Uh, by and large, the focus was on adoption of technologies which were not patented in India, not protected in India or even if they were protected it was a case of well let's see if they enforce it against us, no. Let's copy it, let's use it and if they enforce it against us we'll see what can be done. They expanded into the export market in the 90s and the first shall I say, uh, a rude awakening to something called patent litigation happened when they got sued by a US company. And that's when they realized that you can be in India, you can perhaps adopt a technology that is not patented in India, but the minute you try and send it out elsewhere, when you try and develop a market elsewhere, you actually run the same risk that you would have faced in India. And it's a dramatic transition between 1999 to, I have about five minutes? No. Till about 2006. That period of six years saw the entire group completely change its focus from simply reading what came in, oh, shall I say, business literature and brochures at exhibitions and trade fairs, from a system where there was no such concept as an R&D except it was a case of uh, what I would call band-aid repair if something needs to be fixed just put a band-aid across it to a system where you actually had teams being set up whose only job was to see what is the competition doing and let's pick up from there and move ahead. So they actually did a leapfrog from technology that was being implemented, technology of the 70s that was still being implemented to the technology of the 2000s. Today, um, it's interesting, they actually have a portfolio of uh, about 172 patent applications out of which 48 have been, have resulted in patents and this is globally. What is equally interesting is that this particular company doesn't simply say, well we've got an invention, we've got something so let's just go and file a patent application, file a PCT. Well, the financial part of that worries me because you know, they keep filing patent applications, I can keep raising invoices on them. But the fact is they apply their mind. There are processes, there are products, there are materials that are developed along the line and the decision to file or not file a patent application is taken very, very strategically. Which brings me to really this whole question of whether are patents antithetical to trade secrets, are trade secrets antithetical to patents, 
Can the two live together? Can the two work together? Uh, well, this is an entity which has actually shown that they can live together. Let me give you some of the reasons, and these are reasons given by the client to me. It's not reasons that I have given to the client. This is a learning I have acquired from them. There are cases where something is patentable under a specific legislation, under the Patent Act of this country or any other country. But still the decision is taken to not file a patent application. And what's the basic reason there? The basic reason is that the shelf life of the technology is low. So you may have a statutory term of patent of 20 years from date of filing, etc., etc. But the effective term of patent, and I don't mean effective term of patent from the date of grant to the expiry, no. Effective term in terms of the effective shelf life of the protection afforded by the patent is actually quite low. And in circumstances like that, this entity says, I do not wish to file a patent application. If the total term or the total effective protection I get is only going to be four years or five years or six years, it may make sense for me to keep that and retain that as a trade secret. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is the level of obviousness or non-obviousness of the innovation. And this is a, perhaps, a, it could be a topic for another panel on some day in some workshop. It could be a topic for discussion. What, how do you define innovation in the context of patents? Is it the same as the definition of innovation in the context of trade secrets? Are the benchmarks of what qualifies as an innovation in patents and trade, and trade secrets the same? Well, this company seems to have mastered the art of assessing exactly what would be an innovation which goes into the trade secret stream and at what level and at what stage and at what stage does it go into a patent application with hopefully a result of patents. And some of the learning I have acquired from them and this I say with, after having been a patent attorney for 25 years and this is learning from the client. They look at patents, A of course, the requirement of novelty. The requirement of non-obviousness if their assessment of prior art, and I don't mean just prior patents, prior art in terms of patent documents, prior art in terms of technical literature, say prior art that is published or brought out by people in the ASHRAE, which is the professional association. If their assessment is that the, their particular, or let's say product or process has a high degree of non-obviousness over what is available, then the decision is, let's go ahead and patent. If the level of non-obviousness is low, then the decision is taken, let's keep it secret. Uh, here I would, and this is a learning from them again, they do not necessarily use the trade secret. It's documented and it's kept for two reasons. One, to see if it can be licensed out to competitors, existing competitors. Two, it is kept as a weapon with just the sufficient level of commercial hints given at various trade fairs, etc., to keep the competition away from coming into that particular domain. What is also interesting about this particular entity is that where their main job was manufacture of desiccant rotors, you know, those, and I, I'm not talking of air conditioning, small, you know, split air ACs or your wall ACs, you're talking actually a central air conditioning systems. For example, we are not even talking of the ducting. I'm talking of the, the actual air conditioning equipment which is behind the coolers with the desiccant rotor wheels, which has a paper substrate with desiccants impregnated on that. They branched off into investigation on desiccants per se as chemicals. So you've got a company which has taken, moved away from its prime focus, which is manufacture of desiccant rotor wheels into associated technologies. And those technologies are used strategically to license out in similar applications, in completely different applications, because some of those chemicals have applications. So you're talking of zeolites, you're talking of, let's say, ZSM-5, that has applications across a host of technologies, catalysts, catalysts as well. Dr. Gamble knows that we've done enough work together and against each other on that in that area. To detergent manufacturers, they've done that. So it's a fairly interesting experience. Uh, I have two minutes, so I'll just leave with a set of questions which Perhaps it's the sheer cussedness of being a practicing lawyer which makes me ask questions, which prompts me to be a maverick. There are a couple of assumptions behind this whole patents, trade secrets, 
intellectual property regime, what are the assumptions is that it necessarily encourages innovation and investment. Uh, I'm not so completely sure that that is the case. That in all cases, a legislation providing for protection of a particular form of intellectual property actually encourages innovation or investment, I'm not sure. On that, that's something that perhaps we can have a discussion some other day. I'm not so sure that India in particular needs a legislation for trade secrets. Heck, as a practicing lawyer, I can tell you, it just means one more textbook in our library for practicing lawyers. It just means one more legislation to add on and one more legislation where lawyers like us can make money. But does that necessarily, is that actually the solution? The second thing is that, uh, and there's something I learned from an intern who'd come instantly from IIT Gharagpur a long time ago, where intellectual property is concerned, she met, she just once during a discussion made a simple statement. You can't have a shoe box philosophy, you have to go have a shoe shop philosophy. And her logic was simple. If you give shoe boxes of the same size, containing shoes of the same size to everyone in the room, 90% of the population is going to have very uncomfortable feet. But if you have a shoe shop and you don't follow the one size fits all, it's much easier. Where I'm coming from is you can't have a standard regime across areas of intellectual property, across jurisdictions, uh, for example, across uh, even technology industries, across industries, not technologies, across industries and within industries across technologies. I'm not absolutely sure that a single legislation with a single set of aims, for example, a definition of a trade secret, it differs from industry to industry. It can differ. So her logic of a shoe shop philosophy where you're given, where you're giving customers and the customers, I mean the industry who are going to be the users of the system, the option of going into the shop and choosing the shoe size that you want based either on style or shape irrespective of the level of discomfort or if you prefer comfort over style or the best situation of course where you get both comfort and style where you need to give customers a choice and I'm not absolutely sure that that can be always ensured by legislation in the form of a statute. There are courts, the courts, the lawyers, the technologists can arrive at a system which is outside a written statute which can pro perhaps provide that benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nataraj. Um, I'll now turn it over to our second discussant, um, Ms. Sunita Sridharan, founder of SKS Law Associates here in Delhi. Hello. 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 Uh, so it comes on me to be the last uh, speaker here. I am a discussant and it's been a very interesting panel. Thank you all of you for your inputs and now let me just try and look at what I have to say on this because uh, we have gone from what is property to what is artificial intelligence and uh, what is required with regard to trade secrets. As a practicing lawyer in this area of uh, commercialization of intellectual property, that means uh, creation of intellectual property, maintenance and commercialization, we come across a whole host of problems which uh, don't get addressed by the law as it is today. Uh, one of them is creating of the intellectual property and looking at trade secrets. So to that extent, I, I have to kind of disagree a bit with uh, Nataraj here because uh, um, you, we, we don't just look at an alternative, whether patents or is it trade secrets. Quite often, that same technology would have patentable subject matter, and there would be aspects of it which would, we would have to consider to be a trade secret and protect it as a trade secret, except that at the time of filing a patent application, it has not graduated to being a trade secret. It is merely a confidential information. It becomes a trade secret only when it is out there in trade, and as you all know, when the patent application is filed, it is still at a very nascent stage and technology is not really developed at that time. So it takes a lot of uh, uh, you know, discussions with uh, the inventors to really identify what exactly are the elements which could be patentable 
uh, the aspects of technology which would be patentable, which means that it has to follow the strict criteria of patentability, as you know, um, the criteria of patentability are very stringent, especially when it comes to uh, the inventiveness. So to that extent, uh, we have gone ahead, had technology which has had the patent aspects, and not just merely one patent, but a wall of patents, and also a trade secret aspect, which then we go ahead with two separate license agreements, where we have the patent license agreement and we have the um, trans, you know, technology transfer agreement, which would have the know-how. So, and the uh, know-how would uh, exceed beyond the patent life. So it does not lapse when the patent lapses. So we have to make sure that those clauses are there in the agreements which we are looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, trade secret aspects. Now, uh, coming to AI. AI um, is becoming more multidisciplinary, something that we have been working on now, doing a lot of drafting in that area. Internet of Things is something which we do all the time. And we find that uh, uh, we, it is not the sh sharp verticals for technology as we see it today, where we have the bio group and the chemistry group and the, uh, you know, the electronics group working separately in their own silos, um, you know, drafting applications does not work anymore. So for a number of, um, for instance, in medical devices, we need to have the bio person with the electronics person and the mechanical person working together to be able to actually just draft the patent application and then take it forward to whatever has to be done. So even when we do uh, patent acquisitions, when we do patent portfolio acquisitions for our companies, for our clients, um, the due diligence that we have to do requires multidisciplinary approach. So it just can't be that we give it only one kind of a patent attorney and they go through the due diligence there. So with AI, we find that um, you know the systems that we thought were um, very clear and demarcated does not exist anymore. That is one a big, big problem uh, which we need to address. And uh, as of now, with the five-year degree courses, I'm sorry, I say that each time. With five-year degree courses, we don't really have technically trained lawyers available, easily available. It takes a lot of effort. You need to have a minimum of a master's degree uh, in a science and then a law degree, and that is a big gap, and IIT Kharagpur does not really address all of it. And to top it, you need to have multidisciplinary approach. It becomes even more tricky and very difficult. Then, um, with regard to AI, I also find that there are LC issues, there is the ethical, social issues which are coming up. For instance, when I'm working on those issues where uh, we have AI driven, and I think we've had an example recently where we have uh, a car which is, um, you know, a driverless car, and then it knocks off someone, then what happens in such a situation? We had uh, instances where on trial, of a wheelchair, which is run with artificial intelligence. That means it is basically a heuristic learning which has to go into it. And heuristic learning requires a lot of uh, trial and error with a lot of data which is put in. So for that, um, we've had a uh, few accidents. And now when you're talking about wheelchair, you're talking already about a person who's disabled. And then you are empowering him with what you think is a wheelchair which works perfectly in tested conditions or controlled environments. But once you take it out of the controlled environment, what happens? In such a situation, what is, and this is an immediate need to address. But in the next couple of years, we're looking at situations where the ability to reproduce, which we thought was limited only to humans or you know, to organic systems, animals and plants, so on, is now being handed over on a platter to the AI systems, and they are in a position to reproduce. So we are not really looking at merely IPR issues as to creativity. We are also really going back to the basics to look at uh, what are the legal implications in terms of criminal uh, liability, <coughs> in terms of civil liability, and uh, so the entire concept of how we look at the Indian Penal Code or the criminal procedure, all of them would have to have a revamp. And to that extent, I completely agree uh, with the fact that you know it's, it's the tech and uh, you know the technology and lawyers. The lawyers are always uh, at the back, and the technology was in the front, and we were trying to catch up with uh, the technology. But now, the lawyers really need to be very proactive 
and they have to really think in advance that if such a technology comes, what are the implications, what needs to be done, so that the courts are ready. I have situations today where a simple thing as biodiversity, which we have already signed the treaty way back in 1992, um, last year the court, the, the division bench, the judge says, I've never heard of this. I mean, what am I supposed to address? And you're talking about the Biodiversity Act, which has been in place since 2002. So if that is the problem that we face in case of something which is already well established, then you can imagine that what happens in terms of AI systems and what we need to address there. As regards, um, uh, you know, the need for uh, trade secret law, um, you know, as a lawyer, I already find that it's, we, we are so chock a block full of law and there are rules and there are regulations and nobody really seems to understand how to really take it forward except the lawyers themselves. But I completely agree with the fact that, you know, the small and medium enterprises are really worried because they don't understand. So they go to the lawyer and then the lawyer says that there is under the IT Act, there is something, then there is under the Contract Act, there are these contractual obligations and so on and so forth. And then he comes up and puts together what is a trade secret law that we can take it. But he wants, because he's made an investment, he wants the SME, wants this clarity in law in a proactive manner, right in the beginning. What is happening with trade secret is that after the, you know, the horse is bolted, then you're trying to look at how to protect the systems. That's what is happening in real time now. So to that extent, trade secret law would be required uh, probably more as a way of clarification rather than saying that uh, this are the substantive law and this is a procedural law that is traditionally done. More as in case of, um, you know, something which has to do with third party misappropriation, then what has to be done? In case of product liability, what do you look at and so on? For instance, today when I go to the courts on trade secret uh, matters, the court asks for trade secret and trade secret is very clearly established that you should have competitive advantage over the existing competition with your uh, information. But uh, a per, uh, uh, an entity which has just created the information, that information is merely confidential information. It has not graduated to the level of being a trade secret. In such a situation, that confidential information, if there's a third party misappropriation, there's nothing he can do. He can do something only if there is a contractual, it's a breach of contractual obligations. Only in such a situation can he approach the court. But there is nothing else that can be done in such a situation. So from that point of view, uh, as understanding what is confidential information, what is third party misappropriation, what are the, what is the need of the times? Because law in the end has to serve society. And if law cannot really set up and serve what is required, and the need of the time seems to be the requirement of a trade secret law, then we really need to address that. Thank you. So, uh, before I turn it over to the audience, uh, anyone want to comment on anyone else's presentations? I want to give everyone a chance to comment on. Sure. Uh, what I would have not said was excellent only from experience. What I just want to add to what is said is very often when we go to various companies and look at what they do, one of the conditions that we use to decide whether we will file a patent or we'll keep it at least for the moment as a trade secret is whether whatever that invention is or the technology is, whether that is easily reverse engineered. Right? If it is easily reverse engineered, then we'd rather file a patent. But if it's not so easily reverse engineered, we then decide and keep it as a trade secret. That's point number one. And point number two, which I want to just add on to what he said, we also look at the statutory publication time, which is 18 months. Now, if I think that in 18 months, I'm not going to go to the market, and do, then why go and file a patent application today? I either delay the patent application filing and keep it confidential within the books and then file the patent application as and when required when I'm prepared. So you need to look at a business strategy very carefully. It's an effective shelf life of that. So you need to look at all this. And the last part is that you file a patent, you know, only when we, we right at the innovation stage, 
we try and see how to detect infringement. So very often we miss this point as to if we do not, if I'm unable to detect infringement, then what's the value of that claim? So absolutely. I'll just add on to, Please. I'll just add on to what uh, Dr. Gangui said. Okay, I have no idea. I think I can speak loud enough. Uh, ears are shouting in court. <coughs> if anyone can't hear me, just it's how to detect infringement and how to enforce and stop that infringement. At the end of the day, for a business entity, I can tell you as a practicing lawyer, nothing else matters. And isn't there a song that goes, nothing else matters? That's a, that's a theme song of industry. How do you detect infringement? How do you stop infringement? It doesn't matter whether it's patents, trademarks, designs, copyright, geographical indications. That's all good for us lawyers who raise invoices. All a client wants to know is, if I get a property right, a real-time property right, an intellectual property right, how do I detect infringement? How do I stop it? In the case of patents and trade secrets, that's all they're interested in. Which is going to be easier to enforce, which is going to be tougher to enforce. And that's a simple trade-off there. Nothing else. And the last point that I'd like to make on this, again out of sheer experience over several years, is we were uh, actually uh, helping a very, very big Indian business conglomerate uh, in setting up a joint venture with a very, very big, even bigger American company. And when we started our discussions on this joint venture, it turned out that this American company, it's a huge one, okay? They said that most of our work is on trade secret. We have very few patents. Now, how on earth are we going to do due diligence on them or what they know? And how are they going to do due diligence on us of what we know? Because every time they say we know this, we say we also know that. So how do you do this? And I won't go into details of it, but I must tell you that this trade secret, you know, the face of it looks very simple. It's not that simple to really operate. And a mere law does not help. It needs a lot of strategy, it needs a lot of due diligence, it needs a lot of documentation, a lot of systematization, and a lot of discipline. And we need to really bring those business practices and discipline within organizations before we go and start applying the law. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Sunita. Yeah, uh, just two points. Uh, one has to do with, uh, in recent times, uh, filing of patent applications is also like a business strategy, especially the using of the provisional patent application systems that we have under the Indian law. So under this, we file the provisional application, we get a number. And if you do not file a complete specification within 12 months, then uh, it is deemed to be lapsed and it's not published. So it's quite unlike the US uh, provisional patent applications there. So a number of businesses are looking at filing patent applications. They file provisional applications and they will use it by way of saying patent pending for purposes of raising um, you know, uh, in investments, uh, approaching um, capitalists and also to explore and see whether they would actually like to go in for the very expensive exercise of getting a patent. And many times after they have uh, filed for the provisional patent application and they say patent pending for all their various um, discussions and agreements and everything, then um, they, they, they allow it to lapse and then get back into the trade secret. So this is the business reality. So they get back into the trade secret mode because in a provisional patent application, you're just giving the broad scope. You're not disclosing the best method and everything. This is how the Indian system works. So that is one trend which is uh, pretty much out there uh, as to you know the patent and the trade secret aspect. And the second is with regard to trade secret, we kind of assume that um, patents are so expensive and trade secrets are not. Uh, so therefore, it's better to go in for trade secret protection. Uh, when we do intellectual property audits for companies, we notice that wherever they have trade secret aspects, they put in a lot of effort to, to have closed systems. So that itself is a very expensive proposition. The entire systems are in place where they are all, um, you know, uh, only on a need to know basis people go in. So all those contracts, agreements, the, the latest technology which is there to ensure that you know that everything is protected and in case where um, they are of perishable nature the intellectual property 
then they have to maintain it under those kind of uh, protection systems. So it becomes, uh, it's, it's far more expensive. And very often when we are looking at uh, acquisition or uh, uh, of intellectual property or getting into some kind of collaboration uh, where you have two parties with an intellectual property, with regard to trade secrets, it's one thing that we always advise our clients is that please write down whatever you have. And when you go approach for negotiations with the other party, ensure that they also write down all the trade secrets that they have and put them in your envelopes, do your discussions, and then ensure that when you are talking about it, you have a clarity because it's very specific to a given area of technology. We're not talking about the vast, you know, the entire business or the corporation. It's just that area of technology where they're collaborating, they identify the trade secrets beforehand, and then kind of put it in escrow with a third party with whom they can, uh, you know, so that the negotiations don't happen, that, oh, I know this, and you know this, and so on and so forth. Also, we tell them that uh, whatever is to be marked as trade secret, please stamp that as trade secret and ensure that the other party also does that so that later on there is no confusion because we've had a lot of instances where we've had to use third party services of lawyers uh, in other countries to kind of intervene and you know settle these matters, especially where confidential information, trade secrets, patents, all of them kind of get together and create an issue especially when we have confidential information because anything that's confidential to a uh, company is marked confidential, but a trade secret stands a test of its own. It, it's, a, it's a different ball game altogether. So, so just, just two points which I was reading. Thank you. Mark, you want to step in? Yeah. Uh, so one thing I, I want to circle back to and emphasize once again is that trade secrets are, uh, trade secrets and patents are not always about a trade-off. Uh, when, when practicing lawyers, and I was one for, for a decade, when practicing lawyers look at a particular technology, and, and this is the nature of what practicing lawyers do, um, they tend to think in terms of a trade-off because a client comes to you with a very specific problem, a very discrete matter, uh, because they don't want to spend a lot of money on you. They don't give you a, a carte blanche to, to do uh, whatever you want. Um, they, you, you tend to think about protecting that specific piece of technology. But at the level of a company, if you're thinking like a general counsel, you need both patents and trade secrets. You have an integrated uh, strategy. And in fact, you're also going to be relying on trademarks and, and perhaps copyright, particularly if you have software. Uh, so everything works together. And this is also true of at the country level. It's true at the company level. It's true at the company level, at the country level when you're thinking of your national innovation system. Uh, these things all need to work together uh, and complement one another so that you have an effective variety of protection. Um, the second point I, I'd like to make is, is that yes, a trade seat, we, we discussed briefly that trade secrets can be challenging to protect and indeed, this is something businesses are becoming more sophisticated about. It's becoming part of, of what a good manager learns. Uh, it's, it's, it's internal know-how for a company increasingly uh, is, is what are the best practices to protect trade secrets, especially in the era of, of you know, cyber intrusions and, and those sorts of concerns. Companies are trying to get better and better at that and it's just you know, good business and it's just part of being a diligent business person. Uh, the third point about the statute. Does India need a statute? Uh, one, there are two virtues of a statute. One is, is the, the, the clarification. But of course, uh, everybody in this room is familiar with common law systems. Uh, so I don't have to sell you on the virtue of the, the common law and the, your ability to discern law from the common law. Um, when, I, when I talk to European audiences, that they sometimes think, you know, that there is, you, that having common law is way far too uncertain. <coughs> but the difficulty with India's current law is that a lot of the trade secret uh, laws still stems from two English case, cases, uh, Coco v. a and in, and uh, Saltman Engineering. And those cases are indeed the foundation of those two English cases are the foundation of trade secret law in many common law countries. But what has happened is most of those countries uh, have, have, been, have evolved to add uh, third party li liability for, um, for essentially economic espionage. 
uh, India and New Zealand maintain a relationship-based uh, view of trade secrecy where somebody can only be liable if they breach a relationship. Therefore, an unscrupulous competitor can spy on you, and as long as they don't induce one of your employees to, to breach a duty, um, they can get away with it, essentially, under trade secret law, that there's no, no remedy. And that's the sort of thing that a statute can more quickly um, correct. And I know when I did this project for the OECD, New Zealand came to us when we, we pointed out New Zealand's law had not evolved, unlike England's, the UK's, and, and Hong Kong, and, and Singapore, and Malaysia, and other common, you know, countries with an English legal heritage. Um, and New Zealand said, well, we're a common law country. We could change our law, so we should get credit for that. Um, and we said, well, the, the difficulty is if you're advising a client, uh, the client is, unless the client wants to be the test case, and very few clients do, right? Uh, we, we would like them to spend that kind of money, uh, but very few, few clients sign up to be the test case, so the law is still too uncertain, and you, a statute can add that certainty and the security that you need when advising a client and the security the client needs to feel before they make an investment choice. So that brings up a question in my mind. Uh, in the United States, the vast majority of trade secrets are employers chasing former employees. Uh, do you have a lot of these cases in India? Yeah. Pretty huge. And that is why I think it's very important that you know one is our employer-employee contracts need to be looked into very carefully, number one. And number two, the documentation within the organization has to be more systematic, number two. And number three, um, it's almost becoming a practice now, but we need to really uh, enhance it and make it more systematic, is exit interviews. It's going to be extremely important. How do you conduct an exit interview? How do you document an exit interview? And how do you make it enforceable? Because as you rightly pointed out, that we are all within the framework of a contract. So how do you make that happen? And your success in the court is going to be all based on these aspects of that. I don't know whether you want to add something. So, uh, you, you go ahead, finish your thought. I want to make sure the audience gets a chance to ask questions. But. Uh, it's just that uh, the whole thing of chasing employees, the number of cases between domestic entities, I mean as in India origin entities, on intellectual property, a large number of them typically involve also chasing an employee who's left you and gone on somewhere else. The person may have moved on to a third company, but you do bring that person in, so it's quite common. Um, yeah. Very successful actually. Yeah. Uh, there is also a trend, and I wish Gauri was here, but, but there's also a trend that uh, in certain areas of technology where uh, it's a small um, it's a small group, it's like a small fraternity. So it's always the scientists from one going to the other. And usually when they go to the other, it's a competitor that they're going to. So um, uh, there are a number of cases now coming up where criminal cases are filed against uh, the, uh, the scientists. Um, even though patent applications have been filed and the correct way to do would have been to oppose those patent applications, pre-grant opposition, post-grant opposition, whatever is the way. But um, uh, all discussions, and we've had one of this uh, uh, two years ago in 2016, and now the matter is uh, before criminal courts, is um, now we, we have said that there's absolutely nothing which is uh, you know, infringing or, uh, if, uh, I'm sorry, it, it has not, nothing has been copied. There's no trade secret uh, carried away, nothing, not even confidential information. It's very clear that the patent application is a completely different one. But as a deterrent, they have filed a police case, and a police case, though they are out on bail, uh, the fact of the matter is um, it is just a great tool uh, to break down competition and then bring it out in the newspapers, which they did saying that so-and-so company is copied all our information and so on. So that is a, a new trend which is coming up with regard to uh, chasing the employees. Um, so I want to make sure the audience gets a chance to hear. Uh, you can uh, 
direct your questions to any member of the panel, or you can just pose a question to the panel uh, as a whole. So, so the gentleman over there, yeah. Hello. So, hi. My question is to Dr. Ganguly. Sir, you have said that uh, uh, AI works. The question uh, which now occurs is whether AI works can be granted the status of person or not. So, my question is uh, particularly limited to copyright law. So, my question is can AI works be termed as creative in the legal sense? In the real sense, considering the fact that they basically rely on the input fed, which is already existing and they do not produce anything creative which is new. Very interesting question. And that's precisely what the debate is. That if you saw that uh, picture which I showed you of Remran, or the new Remran, what was very interesting was there were two AI systems. These two AI systems have self-learned. With the data that was fed, it learned what and how Rembrandt had done those several paintings. From that, learning. It said, now if I am Rembrandt, right, how would I paint? And that painting came out of something like that. The other AI system actually went and criticized and said, no, 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 Rembrandt would have done it that way. And then it went through that. So please understand the difference between autonomous systems, self-learning and deep learning systems versus programmed learning. This is not programmed learning. Yeah? So there is a big difference. So it's a creative work. Now the question comes in, is whether this you would then call the, these AI systems as computers? Therefore, when you go to the Copyright Act, would you then call them as computer-generated works? Or these are not computer-generated works, but autonomous systems? And that's the debate. So these are the type of things that are going to open up. And therefore, there will be issues of authorship, and if you go to the area of inventions, it will also come into the area of this. The other part is prior art. What is prior art? There's going to be a lot of these questions which will come in. And in due course, uh, these are issues. There's a third point that in the US, in one of the courts, I forget which court in the US, where the judge actually used, in a criminal case, an AI-based system to decide whether a criminal will be given a parole or won't be given a parole. The AI system looked into the records and everything and came to the conclusion that no, no, this guy could probably be a habitual uh, criminal, so don't give him parole. The question that was asked there was what sort of data was used to train this AI system, therefore was it biased already? So there are going to be lots and lots of such questions which will come about. I had a question for Professor Gongoli. Uh, I really found it. found your idea very revolutionary, sir. Uh, what if AI is regarded as a legal entity? In that scenario, the question arises is whether what is what he creates something new, the author or the creator of AI, will he get the payment for that on the grounds of contract of service? Because because he has created the AI. And the AI is working under his direction somewhere down the line. So is there a contract of service between the author and the AI that we need to pay to the main author who created AI? Or the AI has self generated something new, and that is a legal question. Where does the patent go for that? Because I do not think the AI is desirous enough to get a patent. I don't think he wants one. Is that no, the question is, like, if I and you collaborated, we did both collaborated. Yeah. We discussed, and we came with an invention. The question of inventorship will be, how much did you contribute or did you contribute to the inventive part of it? And if you did and if I did, then we would be joint inventors in that, right? That would be the assessment. Exactly the same thing. Now, if the AI system, if the AI system did it independent of you, as I said, today we are going into, you know, Murthy and others are experts, the technical experts in these areas. But what I'm saying is that if, if you look at today's systems, today's AI systems are in specific areas, not in general, in specific areas, they are systems which are able to self-generate. 
self think self express then it doesn't need you right today you can see examples where ai systems have created music i have in my system in my computer okay believe it or not i am a great beatles fan even today you listen to that which is created with the ai system i can't differentiate whether it was the original beatles or is the ai system it's fantastic so under those circumstances where technology is moving that fast now the question is that where is the difference have ai systems already overtaken us and the answer is no because AI, the human brain can do a large number of things parallelly the ai systems can't it can do specific stuff so if you look at technology today as it's defined uh, the best ai system in the world today as i speak is as good as the brain of a cockroach as it says so for it to reach the brain of a human is going to take quite some time but for specific jobs it can do lots of more stuff i have another question with that following up so if i i want to make sure that everyone in the audience gets a chance to give a mic this is not a question on ai or some trade secrets i have a question for mark and for guru uh regarding the link between say trade trade secret protection and investments or trade uh do you think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that link may be rather tenuous in the sense that india despite having a re relatively weak trade secret uh, protection law we see a lot of uh, american and european companies setting up high tech r&d centers i mean some of the biggest r&d centers outside the us for ge microsoft are in india So do you think I mean it really doesn't matter to a lot of these companies of what your trade secret law is because we've seen even with China despite a lot of complaints China still seems to attract a lot of investment and R&D. Uh my question for Guru and even now uh, Sumita if she can answer this is on regarding a practical experience on how employers use trade secrets uh you know laws against or just contracts or criminal law against former employees because i've seen quite a few cases where in the guise of protecting trade secrets they slap some criminal cases under the indian penal code on offenses against property and you have policemen come showing up at the residence of these employees taking them into custody because they're cognizable offenses and then basically arm twisting them into signing some kind of agreement and that's my real concern with how a lot of these trade secret uh, clauses play out on the ground in india that when we have such a weak rule of law in this country there's a possibility of abuse and that has an effect on downstream competition because former employers uh, former employees are usually the best competitors to their former uh, employers thank you so so the response uh, the the question is Well there there seems to be some anecdotal experience that perhaps contradicts the empirical results. Um and one thing about empirical results is it, when you're when you're looking at a, a relationship like this a, a correlation is that you're always you're always talking about marginal effect. And so it's not that these things it's not that the outcome doesn't happen. It's just uh it happens you know it 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 tap it's less likely to happen. Um, and so that's one response and and that, that that might sound like a bit of a dodge uh so but it's it's not I mean that that's that's how these these things work and that's why you do empirical work to to get beyond the anecdote and just look at the general relationships well but how do you know that things will be vastly better yeah exactly and I mean, what is the baseline yeah and then and then the the but 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 then you know you also should address the, the substance of a question like that and and i think there's a, a couple of responses do businesses behave a bit differently with respect to large markets yes they do and china of course is the perpetual exception and when i talk to general counsels and and in house lawyers um they they often grit their teeth and and they're frustrated because they have these problems and they and they knew they were going to have these problems when they they're their CEO went into China but they went anyway because they can't they can't avoid that market and they want to be in that market uh but but it does affect how they do business and that's the the final piece of this there's if you look at uh, not in the legal literature but in the business literature you know you you talk to business professors and they have a literature going back decades 
about choice of investment form, choice of corporate form when you do cross-border investment. And they would have, they, they, they've said for years that you know, trade secret protection in particular uh, strongly affects the, the form in which you go into a country, the form in which you do FDI. And you're less likely to, you're, you're more likely to distribute your knowledge, you're more likely to limit exposure uh, if you're less confident and you're more concerned about leakage in a particular jurisdiction. Doing R&D though, you know, there's always trade-offs, right? So R&D sounds like, yeah, that, that's, that's a, uh, the kind of effort where there could be a lot of leakage. Well, why would you do that in a, a jurisdiction with relatively weak um, trade secret protection? Well, yes. India may have relatively weak trade secret protection, but it has relatively strong human capital. Uh, it has a relatively well-educated uh, engineers and others who, who, and lots of bright minds, and there are always trade-offs, and so yes, they'll still come here and do that, but there may be you know, marginally fewer who, who come here, or they may be a little more cautious and be less likely to give some of the most plumb assignments to the R&D facility here, the most advanced assignments. Uh, that's it's a, it's a, always a question of degree. Mr. Natraj, did you want to take the? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, the last one first on the whole specter of uh, deterrence through criminal actions. I just tell you what I tell clients: uh, don't do it. Because today you're doing it to someone else. Tomorrow it could be you. Right. So if an in-house person comes in and says. I want to go after X, Y, Z, who was a manager in R&D, and I want to file a complaint. And tomorrow, when you leave, which you will, the years on the line, the same company who's my client could come up with you. So it's not exactly the best situation to be in. Sometimes I accept that, sometimes I don't. If they don't, I don't represent them. That's my choice. That's a separate issue. No, but from a, from a policy perspective, like from if we had to codify a law, setting out a law, oh, and this is my problem, with legislation which comes into a statute book, it's easy to craft a law, it's easy to invite public comment, it's easy to enact a law, but when four years down the line you realize it hasn't served its purpose, it's next to impossible to get it off, right? We all know that as lawyers, at least in this country, it's impossible to get it off. What do you do? You go to the High Court, you go to the Supreme Court, and you've seen things that are happening on a certain piece of legislation which, where attempts are made to make them mandatory, which has been lingering for a year and a half, on biometric measurements, right? You know exactly where I'm coming from. Why I'm against a codified law, at least on trade secrets, is A, we don't know what factors are going to influence what goes into the law. And I'm not running on parliamentarians, it's lawyers, it's businesses, we are all responsible. Action. There is no guarantee or even a iota of assurance that the legislation that is drafted will actually address the concerns. Because this much I have learned as a lawyer. As a lawyer, if I understand technology and IP a little extent, not too much, parliamentarians, the level of understanding, knowledge is perhaps lesser than ours as lawyers. So this is not something I would want to codify. Third, as a common law system, we do not need to, and thanks by the way, uh, Dr. Schultz, Sotman is a case which I'm going up, I think, for 20 years. Uh, thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, as a common law system which relies on skills, legal skills of practitioners, the legal, uh, or rather I would say, the jurisprudence developed by courts, the flexibility to grow and evolve into a system that is better suited for this society is much better. And that's one of the reasons why I'm against codification. I'm against setting down definitions. We've had enough problems, for example, with the Patent Act, on what is the meaning of programs per se. What's the meaning of per se? Just those two words. It's easy for us lawyers to rattle off per se, new titles, new titles, etc., etc. But getting that, understanding exactly that what that means has caused a problem. The minute we get a legislation, we get definitions. The minute you get definitions, 
You have a bunch of lawyers who say one thing and a bunch, another bunch of lawyers saying the exact opposite depending on who's paying them. And once you get a situation like that and you find that the situation doesn't meet what the country needs, not what a specific business needs, it's literally impossible to get it off and then we pay the price down the line. I have been for too long a patent practitioner and a little bit here with a slightly drinkard vision that the world world was patents and nothing but patents. For a long time it was prosecution. I would like to think that there's a life beyond that and there's learning beyond that. And on a lighter note, I sincerely hope that AI entities, AI, oh, I mean, let's say artificial intelligence doesn't start deciding the cases in court. I sincerely hope that. Even for a purely selfish motive, I hope they don't become lawyers. <laughs> Um, and and on, on that note, there is coffee after this panel. So let's thank our panel for excellent presentation. <laughs> coffee outside. Professor Kizan, can you please remain within the room? Oh, yes. Thank you.